Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Héo. This is an interview I've been looking forward to for years. Dr. Dale Bredesen is shaking up the medical world by showing that Alzheimer's actually can be prevented, treated, and sometimes even reversed. This is really important to me because my mom is in the final stages of Alzheimer's, and I, of course, am doing everything I can to prevent myself from falling to the same fate. I believe the sapient way of eating and lifestyle is doing just that, setting me up for my best chances at my longest health span. You can learn more about this at sapien.org diet. Dr. Bredesen and I agree on all of the core principles. He really is describing a saving diet with his protocol. We're only at odds with the ratio of plant foods to animal foods. As I've posted about today on social media, I think people are actually more on the side of animal foods than they think. In the context of a whole foods, low carb diet without refined grain, sugar, vegetable oil, more often than not, people are getting the majority of their calories from animal foods without necessarily realizing it. Only people eating standard American diets or Mediterranean diets and the like are getting most of their calories from plant foods from all the empty calories coming from grains and other carbohydrates. Many health figures in the space say things like a plant-heavy diet or fill half your plate up with greens, and people take this as being akin to a vegetarian diet. As I showed in my post, a daily intake where about 70% of the plates are filled with plants are actually 90% animal foods by calories. I actually eat this way a lot. This is carnivore adjacent, and it's part of the sapien framework. You're still getting a ton of flavor, variety, and nutrients from plants, even though they're not as bioavailable, but you're really getting 90% of your calories from animal foods. So make your own decision on the ratio of plant to animal foods, but from what I've found, higher animal foods is more species appropriate for homo sapiens and is actually what most people avoiding empty calorie nutrient poor foods is already doing. As always, I didn't want to press him on this. I don't invite people on my podcast to tell them I don't agree with their opinions. I'd love for this to be debated with a moderator at some point, but as long as it's a one-on-one PQ and podcast, I'm letting the guests speak their minds. Here's a bit of Dr. Bredesen's extensive resume. He received his undergraduate degree from Caltech and his medical degree from Duke. He served as resident and chief resident in neurology at UCSF. He was a director of the Eason Center for Alzheimer's Disease Research. He's a professor in the Department of Molecular and Medical Pharmacology at UCLA School of Medicine. And he's the founder of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. The Bredesen Laboratory studies basic mechanisms underlying the neurodegenerative process and the translation of this knowledge into effective therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions, leading to the publication of over 220 research papers. He and his group developed a new approach to the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, and this approach led to the discovery of subtypes of the disease, followed by the first description of the reversal of the symptoms in patients with MCI and Alzheimer's disease with the RECODE protocol, published in 2014, 2016, and 2018. His book, The End of Alzheimer's, is a New York Times bestseller and has been translated into 29 languages. I'll largely skip the plugs for today. Everyone listening knows about the Food Lies film on Indiegogo, the Patreon at patreon.com slash peakhuman, and my new grass-fed meat company, nosetotail.org. If you find any value in this podcast or my other content on YouTube or social media channels, please consider supporting me and my projects there. I wish I could really get across how much it means to me. It's honestly the only way any of this is possible. Thanks so much, and I'll most likely end Season 3 with this episode and come back in a couple weeks with an amazing Season 4. Here's a future legend, Dr. Dale Bredesen. All right, well, Dr. Dale Bredesen, thanks for coming on the podcast. Great interview with you at the Metabolic Health Summit in person for Food Lies. Great, thanks very much for having me. Yeah, well, it's good to talk to you again. So yeah, we went over some of this stuff for the film, and now I want to go deeper. We have a little bit more time here. You've been researching Alzheimer's and cognitive decline and neuro everything for your whole career, basically, and you've been in in the lab for about 30 years. So I think you're the best person I could be talking about this stuff. So from the high level, though, what do people need to know about Alzheimer's? And let's just start from the top. Yeah, so we have, as you mentioned, we have been interested in the phenomenon of neurodegeneration for three decades and uh, published over 220 papers on our research. And we've been interested in the question, can we understand the fundamental nature of this so that we can begin to fashion the first effective treatments? And I think that the first thing for people to realize, and it's often not stated, is that when you go to a clinic with cognitive decline, 
the clinic does not ask why the cognitive decline occurs. They say, oh, you have Alzheimer's. You say, well, why did I get Alzheimer's? Well, we don't know. It's important. What we are doing that is different is that we are asking for each person why the cognitive decline occurred. And there are many reasons. We look at all the different contributors. Right now, we look at 150 different variables to determine what has actually contributed to your cognitive decline. And our belief is that only by understanding, by identifying what those critical variables are, can we have the best chance of improving the situation. Mm. A lot of people treat it as a single disease and try to treat things the same way. And I know you have a great quote about the 36 holes in the roof. Right. When our research, and this, again, this has come you know, straight from the lab, with the research we did for years on cells and on fruit flies and on transgenic mice and things like that, we looked at what are the molecular pathways that drive the phenomenon of neurodegeneration. And what we found is that uh, there's an entire network. So no big surprise, you know, human beings are complicated. And so this idea that we're just mm -hmm. going to get a monotherapy, a single drug, and that's going to deal with all the different contributors, it actually doesn't make a lot of sense. So when you look at the specific things that drive this phenomenon, we initially identified 36. We now know there are a few more, but it's not dozens of things mm -hmm. that drive the signaling in your brain toward what we refer to as Alzheimer's. And as you know, the big surprise has been that what we call Alzheimer's is actually a protective response of your brain to several different types of insults. Now, you can ask the obvious question, like, well, how can a protective response cause degeneration? It's very much like pulling back in a mm -hmm. war and scorching the earth. So if you have a scorched earth retreat, you are pulling back, but you're also making it so that the things that are coming toward you, the bad guys, don't have access to anything. And that's exactly what we see with Alzheimer's. You're pulling back. You are retreating, trying to live literally with a slightly smaller network for a brain, and you are scorching the earth. You are damaging what's there so that as a strategy, you're not allowing things like fungi and bacteria and spirochetes and viruses to utilize those resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the amyloid plaques that you're talking about. So long we thought that that was the solution. We just found these plaques and we're like, oh, let's get yeah. rid of them and we'll cure Alzheimer's. Yeah, that's a great so how does point. That work? And you know, we analogize it to, you know, imagine that you're head of a country and let's call it, you know, my brain of Stan. That's mm -hmm. your country. And okay, into the country mm -hmm. come the bad guys and they come across the border. And so you're now going to put down something like napalm. And okay, when you do that, you're trying to kill the bad guys, but you are also decreasing your own arable soil. You're decreasing the size of your workable country. And that's what this amyloid is like. The amyloid is an antimicrobial. It also, by the way, binds toxins. It also changes your response to glucose. So in fact, it has all these remarkable properties, but it does lead to a decrease in the size of your neuronal network. You are literally decreasing the size of that. Again, just like putting down napalm to get at the invaders. And so yeah, there is a trade-off. You're saying, you know, I'm not supporting the size of brain that I currently have, so I'm going to downsize. If you think about it, it actually works quite well because people will go for 20 years or more with the underlying pathophysiology of Alzheimer's and yet be functioning quite well. So ultimately, though, of course, as you keep pulling back, keep pulling back, keep pulling back, now you start to have big problems. Therefore, what we want to do is not to start by get rid of, but getting rid of the amyloid. We want to start by getting rid of the reason that you're putting it down. We want to know if you have ongoing mm. inflammation, if you have any insulin resistance, if you have glycation damage, if you have specific toxins, if you have decrease in hormones or trophic factors or nutrient support, if you have poor vascular support, any of those things, then we want to get rid of those first. Then it's fine to remove the amyloid. Absolutely. The root cause is so important with this new way Absolutely. of thinking medically. It's so interesting what you're saying about how the body works. 
it's the same as it puts down the plaque. It, it protects itself to keep it going. Like for a woman who's pregnant, she can leach minerals and different things necessary for the baby out of the, her own body. That's exactly right. That's a baby. good analogy. That, yeah, so, you're, you're basically doing something that it has harm in one area, but it's support another area. And absolutely, when you have Alzheimer's, you are damaging your network, but you are giving yourself additional protection against whatever insults are affecting you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we should get into the, all these different insults. So you kind of categorized Alzheimer's into three or actually four different main. Absolutely. Yeah. And now we've actually identified two more. So we now have a total of six. So type one, as you indicated, you know, type one is inflammatory. So anything that gives you chronic systemic inflammation, not only will it increase your risk for cardiovascular disease, it also increases your risk for cognitive decline. So whether it's the you know, Borrelia of Lyme disease, whether it's poor dentition, whether it's leaky gut, anything that gives you that chronic ongoing inflammation. Again, you're making the amyloid because you're trying to kill the microbes that are part of what's causing that inflammation. Second thing is type two, that is with a, what we call atrophic, a decrease in trophic support from, say, nerve growth factor or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or from hormones, estradiol, testosterone, progesterone, pregnenolone, things like that, or from nutrients, things like vitamin D, B12, things like that. Any of those things that decreases the support from the network, again, pushes you toward downsizing. That We call that type 2 or atrophic Alzheimer's disease. And then there's one that's called type 1.5, which is glycotoxic or sweet. Very common. And this is, we call it 1.5 because it actually gives you both features of one and two. When you have too much sugar and you now have too much insulin, you, you develop insulin resistance, you get the inflammatory part from the glycation of the proteins that alters the proteins and you can recognize them as abnormal and develop an inflammatory response. But you also have resistance to insulin and insulin is one of the most important trophic factors in the brain. We spent years growing neurons in dishes in the lab. And when you do that, you always have to include some insulin because it is an important trophic factor. So you lose both of those and you get a combination. That's why we call it type 1.5 or glycotoxin. Then type Three is toxic, and that can be from three different classes of toxins, metals and other inorganics, and mercury is the big one when it comes to cognitive decline. As you know, you can get that both from things like your dental amalgams, uh, or you can get it from things like seafood ingestion, things like tuna fish and swordfish and shark and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then second is organic toxins. So for example, we have one patient, for example, who had been exposed for years to the toxic burning of paraffin candles and had very high levels of benzene and uh, formaldehyde and toluene uh, in her blood. These things are damaging. Um, and then the third group is the biotoxins, things that are made by organisms. And the common one there is mycotoxins from molds, things like stachybotrys that make trichothecenes. These things are neurotoxic. And so you can damage your brain with these. So that's type three or toxic. And then type mm. four is vascular and type five is traumatic. Those are things that can also give you increase in risk for Alzheimer's. Mm, wow. And then go back to the candles. Are you talking about just normal candles if someone was in a closed room for yeah, years so and years? Yeah, so paraffin candles turn out to be pretty toxic. So you don't want to do this a lot. If you're going to be doing a lot of candle burning, think about switching over to like beeswax or something with less toxicity. If you do a quick check for toxicity of candles, you'll see that actually paraffin candles are quite toxic. Wow. And then mycotoxins, I've heard about those in coffee. Are there other places? Yes, and actually mold, uh, much more than in coffee. Yeah. The big ones are actually the ones that you're breathing. And so the ones that what happens is for homes that get water damage. Now, if you're lucky, the water damage is associated with mold growth of molds that aren't making the bad toxins. However, if you're unlucky, then mm -hmm. in fact, the molds that grow will include the big five. And there are five molds that are concerning. One of them is called stachybotrys, as I mentioned. One of them is aspergillus. One of them is penicillium. 
one of them's ketomium, and one of them's walemia. Those are the big five. So you want to know if those are in your house. And you can do this by getting an ERMI score or by getting what's called a Hertz Me Too score. You can literally go on to Mycometrics, for example, um, and just you know, they give you a little kind of a Swiffer duster looking thing. You send it in and they can tell you how much of this is actually in your home or in your place of work or whatever you want to look into. So that's an important way to know, you know, am I exposed to these mycotoxins? And these things can damage not only your brain, they can also damage your immune system, making it more likely that, in fact, you can't fight off the very molds that you're trying to fight off. Um, so they have, and they can damage your kidney, they can be associated with increased risk for cancer. So lots of different uh, toxins associated with molds. Yeah, I can link to some of those in the show notes of where oh, to great. get those tests and stuff like that. But also there's um, inflammation yeah. markers too. You talked about inflammation and I know there's CRP, then HSV, even the right. herpes simplex one. What can people get tested for? Yeah, th so the easy way to go is just to get an HSCRP. That's a high sensitivity C-reactive protein and you want that to be clearly below 1.0. You can also look at other things like a tumor necrosis factor, like interleukin-6, interleukin-8, things like that, or interleukin-1 beta, any of those things. But in general, the CRP is pretty good. Then you want to know if you've got a question about molds, um, what Dr. Richie Shoemaker suggested is that you look at specific activations of the innate immune system. You can get tests like C4A, TGF-beta-1, uh, MMP9. All of these are on his website, which is called survivingmold.com. Mm, okay. I'll link to that as well. What else would, for a normal patient to go into a doctor and say, oh, well, what's my A1C or my vitamin D levels? Yeah, great. And in fact, you can now do this, you know, we have it, you can do it directly um, and then take the, the report into your doctor. So you can actually get yeah. directly on drbredesen.com or you can go to a doctor and ask him for these tests. And you're absolutely right. What you want to know is you want to know, do I have ongoing inflammation? That's an issue. Do I have ongoing glycotoxicity? And the key ones there are to get fasting insulin. That tends to be the most sensitive, and you want that to be five or lower. And then you want to have, as you said, a hemoglobin A1C. You'd like to see that down anywhere from four and a half to 5.2 or so. And then you'd also like to have a fasting glucose, and you'd like that to be clearly below 90. So those are all helpful for the glycotoxic form. And then you'd like to know about your nutrients, hormones, and trophic factors. So you'd like to know your vitamin D. You'd like to know your pregnenolone, progesterone, estradiol, testosterone, free T3, which is your thyroid, of course, free T4, also your thyroid, TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, and then also your reverse T3, which is actually an inhibitor of the effect of your thyroid hormone. These are all important for knowing where you stand. Well, yeah, that's a lot of things. I, it, it is a complicated... But it's a really good point we make because, you know, for years, this has been the problem. For years, people have said, we're not going to check anything and we're just, we're going to say, we don't know what this is all about. And then we're just going to give you a drug. And this is a little bit like taking your car in and you say, you know, my car's not working well. And the mechanic says, oh yeah, we know what this is. This is called car not working syndrome. And Alzheimer's is, it's like, you know, we don't know what it is. It's after a, a name of a person, a Dr. Alzheimer that doesn't tell you what's causing it. And then when you say, well, aren't you going to do these tests for my car? They say, well, they're not reimbursed. So we don't do it. I mean, it's crazy. Human beings are complicated organisms, as you know. And what causes this complex chronic illness is more than one thing. So we need to look at all of the contributors and address all of them. Exactly. And you mentioned glycotoxicity. So just quite catch what that yeah. meant. I mean, we're talking about sugar. <laughs> the biggest problem, it's probably what I talk about every episode, is all these diseases come down to insulin resistance and too much sugar, really. You know, it's so interesting to me because we've gotten to a point where we don't think about it so much. And I, as bad as anyone, I grew up in an era um, in which sugar was everywhere. You know, if you were good, you got to drink a, a soda. This was, you know, years ago. But, um, you know, if you were good, what did you get? You got a piece of candy. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. And the analogy that I've made is that, you know, human beings were not designed evolutionarily to fly. If you were a bird, you're designed to fly, right? If you're a human and you jump out of a window and start flapping mm -hmm. your arms, you crash. Well, the same thing. We were not meant 
We were not evolutionarily designed to eat more than a small amount of sugar. And so what happens when you try to do that, you crash, just like jumping out of a window and flapping your arms. But the crash that occurs with eating sugar takes years, and it includes hypertension, cardiovascular disease, dementia, arthritis, leaky gut. It is amazing how toxic this stuff that I grew up eating every day really is to us. And so we all have to get back to a world in which we're consuming something like, you know, 15 grams a day, not 100 grams a day. We just literally were not built to do that. I completely agree. And I deal with all these weird people online that come out and attack me and like, oh, you're crazy. Why are you you're trying to get people to not eat sugar? Like it's delicious. It's everywhere. You're denying yourself. You know, what's so bad about having a donut? All this kind of thing. Or, or even these people that are diet plans, like if it fits your macros, like, oh, well, as long as you're in a calorie deficit, it doesn't matter what you eat. It's just so crazy. How do you even talk to these people? I mean, you can tell them the evolutionary stuff that you're, you're mentioning. It's just not, our bodies aren't designed for this, but in this modern environment, it's so hard because it exists. So we deserve it. And when I was a kid, it, it, the exact same approach was taken to smoking. They said, look, if people want to smoke, let them smoke. It's no big deal. It's not hurting the rest of us. Well, guess what? Secondhand smoke turns out to be very bad for you. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, over time, people realize, and I have to say, when I was a kid, if someone had told me that you people wouldn't smoke on airplanes, that would actually go through. I would have said, no way. Mm -hmm. Everybody smoked on airplanes when I was a kid. It was a common thing that the airplane was filled with smoke. And now we kind of take it for granted that, hey, guess what? Smoking, not good for you. So I've told our daughters that a sugar is my generation smoking. It's mm -hmm. the thing that has really turned out to be quite bad for us that we didn't realize. We didn't realize how bad it really was. And so the good news about looking at these larger data sets, about looking at these various things like your fasting insulin and like your HDL and LDL and your LDL particle number and your homocysteine, these are things where you can actually see the diseases coming for years ahead of time. So when people say, well, look, it doesn't hurt you to have this, well, actually you can test yourself and show that it is hurting you. You'll start to see that your fasting insulin is creeping up. Your blood pressure is creeping up. Your cholesterol, especially your LDL particle number, is creeping up. All of these things are showing you, yes, you may not feel sick today, but you're on your way to things like dementia and cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of normal. People don't even realize that it, it's not normal to just gain yeah. a couple pounds each year. And they're just like, oh yeah, I, I eat sugar. It's fine. And 10 years later, you're 15 pounds overweight. Exactly. And, you know, along the same lines, so many people will say when they're first having cognitive decline, and this, this is one of the big problems with cognitive decline, it does sneak up on you. We have people, as an example, a woman who came in and said, you know, I feel pretty good, but I've got this in my family. She was 49 years old. We tested her. Her MOCA score, top is 30, and most of us should be 28, 29, or 30. Hers was 23. So she already had significant MCI on her, well on her way to Alzheimer's disease. But it had, you know, come on slowly. So she didn't real, really realize it. Now we put her on the protocol we developed. She now has a repeated score of 30. She's doing great. And she said, you know, I did not realize how bad it was until I got better. And this is a common thing to hear. So it does sneak up on you and you want to look in and get in early and get on prevention. Mm, yeah, I'm 100% there. I guess I should talk about this now about my parents, you know, people know who are, have been listening for a while that my mom is in stage seven, I guess you would call it Alzheimer's. She's totally unresponsive and it, yeah, it's, it's just really been hard and it's gotten me to, you know, really snap to it and take this stuff seriously in the past four years. Yeah, I'm doing everything I can to prevent it. And what's so great about it is it's the same thing I was already doing for other things. People listening are into this sort of ancestral way of eating and they like, you know, they get good sleep and don't eat a lot of refined foods and sugars and exercise. And so all these things are in line with your program on how to prevent Alzheimer's, right? Absolutely. And again, what all we're doing, as I said earlier, is to look with each person to see 
What is your risk? What is giving your risk? What is creating? If you've already got cognitive decline, why? And if you're at risk, why are you at risk? What are your big risk factors? So I actually just got a call from my daughter today, who is a health coach. She called me up about one of her clients, and you know, we went over all the numbers. And uh, it turned out that the coach, the the, uh, the client that she had, ninety percent of the numbers were right on. But a couple of them were clearly in the early stages where she was now increasing her risk. Okay, great. You can deal with those things today. And this person, of course, had had the same situation where her parent had died with Alzheimer's disease. And this is so common. So I recommend for anyone whose parents are in late stage or have passed away, any child of Alzheimer's, as we call them, please get on a prevention program. There is a tremendous amount that can be done. And really, it should end with this generation. This should not be a big concern for my daughter's generation, whereas it was a huge concern for my generation. Yeah. And just to say it again, your book is called The End of Alzheimer's. I talked about in the intro that you didn't hear, but I totally agree. And I know you also say that Alzheimer's should be a very rare disease, right? I mean, our ancestors probably didn't get Alzheimer's. Well, you know, that's interesting you bring that up because our ancestors were all in the highest risk group for Alzheimer's because they were APOE 4-4. In other words, APOE 4 is the most common genetic risk factor. And we have three quarters of our population has no APOE4. So for example, I'm a 3-3, which is the most common. That's kind of vanilla. My chance for lifetime is 9% based on my genetics. If you have a single copy of APOE4, your chance is about 30%. And if you have two copies, it's well over 50%. The reality though is nobody has to get this. This is something that, as you said, should be a rare disease, just as, by the way, cardiovascular disease should be rare. If you do the right things, if you get checked up in the right way, we should be able to prevent this problem. And so for people who are APOE4 positive, find out early, get on prevention, and you should have a very, very low chance of getting the disease. Absolutely. I'm finally going to get my test. I've been, I was a little scared to get my test, but then I realized that it's the opposite. I should be getting it so that I have more information. Everything that we've been doing has been backwards. People say, I don't want to know about my APOE status. No, actually, you should know early. And, and you know, I don't want to get on prevention because I'm just going to wait until I get sick and then there's nothing you can do about it. I'll wait to go to the doctor till late because I know the doctor can't do anything. No, that's all 20th century medicine. 21st century medicine is just as you said. It's about root causes. It's about prevention. What's interesting is in medicine, you know, 100 years ago, Almost all people were dying of simple acute illnesses, things like tuberculosis and pneumococcal pneumonia and things like that. We did a very good job. That was the big success of 20th century medicine. We can treat these between public health measures and antibiotics. We could treat these things like pneumococcal pneumonia. Most people don't die of this today. Now, they might at the very end get it when they've already got Alzheimer's. Today, though, most of us, almost all of us, in fact, are dying of complex chronic illnesses, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, cancer. These are multifactorial diseases that take years to get you. Now, the bad thing, bad problem with this is that we don't have a simple monotherapy for these. You don't just take a drug and it goes away. The good news is we can see them coming if we know what to look for years ahead of time. I mean, this is obviously why you have a pap smear. This is why you have a colonoscopy. And this is why we suggest that people should have a cognoscopy uh, when they turn 45. Get yourself checked out and see where you stand so that you can get on prevention. Because the good news about these complex chronic illnesses is that you can prevent them. If you look at the right thing and do the right things, target the causes and the contributors and the risk factors. In fact, you don't need to get these diseases. Absolutely. These are the diseases of civilization. These are the mismatched diseases. And it's very logical to anyone listening, I think, that doing this ourselves, this is because of how we live in our modern environment. And so that it's pretty easy to, I don't, I don't know, I want to say it's easy. It's a straightforward solution is to undo the all this modern living that we've done. And you talk about this cognoscopy at 45 what about people getting it even earlier if they have some symptoms? And what are those symptoms? Other, you know, People just know, oh, yeah, I forget things. That's Alzheimer's. But is there anything else that's just kind of this high-level stuff that people can look out for? Absolutely. So what you want to look out for, as you mentioned, 
the, uh, the, the lack of ability to learn new things. That's the first part of the downsizing. It's interesting because you're downsizing something that sounds very important, but in fact, you can do a tremendous amount with what you've learned up until you're you know, 45, 50, 55, 60. You can drive, you can interact, you can talk, you can speak, you can understand, you can write, you can calculate. It's amazing what you can do. So what happens if I said to you, okay, you wake up tomorrow morning, you can either forget all those things or you can forget the friends rerun from tonight. You know, that's an easy choice. You don't need the friends rerun from tonight. So in fact, that's what your brain is doing. It downsizes the least important thing and keeps the most important things. Now, as you, as you keep downsizing, you start losing, of course, the most important things until ultimately you can't care for yourself. So that's the first thing is learning new things. And interestingly, if you don't notice that your memory is worse, but your spouse or a significant other notices, that actually is more concerning for Alzheimer's. One of the things that goes relatively early in Alzheimer's is the ability to know that you're having problems. And so one of the common things is that a spouse will say, you know, my husband or wife is having trouble with memory and the, and the person who's having it will actually say, well, no, I'm, I'm fine. That's more concerning even than when the person knows and their spouse says, no, they're actually quite good. Second thing is organization. And this is a relatively common presentation as well. People who were really good organizers, and I, I often ask people, you know, what if you had to throw a bunch of stuff in a suitcase and get the right things to take a trip and you had to do it within 30 minutes? You know, could you do that? And they'll say, oh, gosh, you know, I can't organize things the way I could before. And this is something that really plays havoc on people's jobs. They often get fired because they can no longer organize things as well. Similarly, calculation, another thing that can come up very early. One of the people, for example, came in, first thing that happened was she could not calculate a tip anymore. Uh, people will have trouble paying bills, things like that. And then often finding the right word or yeah, another one is getting lost in traffic. Again, things where they were really familiar, you pull into a familiar neighborhood, but you pull up to a stop sign, you have no idea where, which way to go. And then sometimes they'll come back and it's like, wow, what was that all about? Those can be some of the earliest changes in Alzheimer's disease. Frequently, people will say, you know, I had a senior moment. Okay, well, look, get it checked out. Better to be safe and have someone tell you, yeah, don't worry about it. That, that was fine. You're, you know, you're doing well than to have someone say, gee, you waited too long and now it's really late and it's really difficult to do something about it. Mm, okay. Well, yeah, I guess I should probably get checked. I'm 35 now just to get this extra early screening. And what are the big things that people should avoid in general? Like you're talking about glycotoxicity, sugar, other than sugar. Yeah. So it's a good point. If you look at, again, we try to do it so that we direct it specifically at what's actually causing it. In that sense, it's great to have the blood tests, the so-called cognoscopy, and to see what's actually driving your risk or your decline. But there are some basics that everyone can do. And as you mentioned, keeping insulin sensitive. And so they're the basics. Eating a diet that is a plant-based, we call it Keto Flex 12-3. It's a plant-based or plant-rich uh, diet that is high in good fats, uh, low in carbs, and as low as possible in simple carbs and intermediate in proteins. Exercise, making sure you don't have sleep apnea, that you're getting enough sleep each night, stress reduction, brain training, some specific herbs like bacopa and ashwagandha that actually turn out to be quite helpful. Detoxing, making sure that your gut is not leaking, making sure that you optimize your microbiome. So all those are basics that we can all do that are pretty straightforward to do. Getting yourself into some mild ketosis is helpful, especially if you already have symptoms. For those who are asymptomatic, you don't necessarily need to do that, but you still do want to eat a diet that is uh, you know, that is plant-based uh, and that is high in good fats. Mm, yeah, I'm a big fan of ketogenic sort of, not always, maybe cyclical. Maybe we can talk about going in and out and not always being strictly in ketosis, but some sort of metabolic flexibility. But also uh, I'm interested to know about the plant-heavy part. So I've been eating a lot of animal foods lately and feeling really good. And and I, I just interested to know about the ratios that you believe are, are best. And if you can be in ketosis, then, you know, some people can be in ketosis eating quite a bit of animal foods. And what do you think about that? No, no question. You can be in ketosis eating animal foods. And that's been, been that was kind of the original ketogenic diet. We advocate more of a plant-based ketogenic diet for several reasons. 
Uh, one of them is that we want to get the phytonutrients. They actually turn out to be quite helpful. They are good anti-Alzheimer's nutrients. So, you know, these the various acanthocyanins and the various polyphenols and things like that are, are actually quite helpful. Yeah, we recommend, this is why we call it KetoFlex 12-3. So we try to get people into mild ketosis, typically somewhere between one and four millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. And we actually recommend people get a simple, inexpensive ketone meter. It's easy to do. And then uh, the uh, we call it keto flex because it's flexitarian. You want to be a vegetarian? No problem. You want to not be a vegetarian? That's okay too. We recommend that you use uh, fish and meat as condiments, so you know, relatively small amounts. You don't have high mercury fish. Things that, like we talked about, you know, like the uh, swordfish and shark and tuna fish and tile fish and things like that. You want to do more like the smash fish, the you know salmon, mackerel, not king mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Those are the ones the high omega three to omega six mm. with the low mercury. Um, and then yeah, you want to have some beef, no problem. Uh, you know, have some grass fed beef. Uh, have some uh, pastured chicken. Be careful, chicken, as you know, has some arsenic in it. Sometimes you got to be careful about that. But yeah, I have some, you know, it's fine. And then the 12-3 means 12 is a minimum 12 hours between finishing your dinner and starting your breakfast, brunch, or lunch. And if you're APOE4 positive, we recommend 14 plus hours because people who are APOE4 positive actually absorb fat better. So they can go a little longer without food. Actually, they do better in starvation conditions than those of us who are APOE4 negative. We are at a disadvantage in starvation conditions. So uh, so that's the 12 and three. And then the three it, part of it is, uh, at least three hours before going to bed, you want to fast. So those are the four parts of this. Some people argue that you should be completely plant-based. Other people say, no, you should really be much more on the meats. We're kind of agnostic, whatever works best for you. But there are, as you know, there are some concerns about too heavy on the animal foods, in part because of the CAFOs, in part because of the hormones. It depends to some extent on um, what's in those animal foods. Mm, yeah yeah exactly and yeah I'm, I'm a fan of the seafoods too and sardines and getting those omega-3s yeah. and also huge fan of the fasting or condensed eating window yeah. with the, your 12-3 part i like to say hey four hours after you wake up and then four hours before you go to sleep yeah i keep it in there i mean that's about an eight hour window of eating it's about 16 hours fasting yeah. and yeah i do that daily and i think it's fantastic and I guess so. I always talk about too is like people can make up their own mind of their ratios of plant to animal foods. Mm -hmm. Just keep them high quality. And the, the most important part is to avoid the processed foods, refined grain, sugars, vegetable oils, and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I also know you're talking about the big four to avoid, which is on the same lines as the simple carbs, grains, dairy, and lectins. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we try to get people again, you know, people are so used to, to eating this stuff and it just becomes it's a habit and people even get addicted to it. You just got to be really careful. Uh, but yeah, grains, huge issue, simple carbohydrates, you know, maybe the worst of all. Um, and then, as you said, dairy, which can be inflammatory. So please be careful about that. And again, you know, you can check, you can look at these things and measure them. And then lectins, that's been a more recent thing. Of course, Dr. Stephen Gundry has published on this in uh, his uh, book, The Plant Paradox, and talks about this. And yeah, for some people, it's clear. And I think he's got cases that show this very clearly. For some people, this is clearly a pro-inflammatory effect. And people can come in with things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune conditions, lupus, and things like that. So uh, for some people, yeah, that can be a real problem and cutting them out can be very helpful. And so those are things, as you know, that are in uh, nightshades, that are in legumes and things like that. So you have to be careful about those. For other people, they seem to do very well with those. Yeah, I think there's also better ways to prepare those. I, I did read the plant paradox and he talks about using a pressure cooker and there's different ways to get the seeds out or take the skin off certain things. Exactly. And, and then same with dairy as well. I mean, I know people have a lot of success eating raw dairy and you know, if you can get it from a good farm and it's legal in your state and that's a whole nother story that it can be non-inflammatory to you. Exactly. And then also- and Again, some people do pretty well with A2 dairy. So you can look at uh, A2 and so for some people that's fine. For most of us, though, yeah, we would like to minimize the dairy as well as grains and as well as simple carbs. Yeah. I know you work with a lot of people on prevention. What kind of success have you seen in people that have had some of these sort of pre-Alzheimer's symptoms and 
you know, have they put it at bay? Have they reversed it? What's been happening in your lab and in your practice? Yeah, so we have published starting in 2014, unprecedented success in reversing cognitive decline. And so let's take them, you know, one step at a time. The first people who are in prevention, we haven't had anyone yet who's converted to having even MCI or Alzheimer's disease. For people who the next step after asymptomatic is called SCI or subjective cognitive impairment. And by definition, that means that you know that things are not quite right. Your spouse may know it. Uh, but when you are testing, your testing is still, quote, within the normal range. Now, of course, that depends on the test you take. That depends. You might have been a genius before and you're still testing normally, but you've actually fallen a long way. So that is at least the definition of subjective cognitive impairment. And virtually all of those people get better. So we see people mm. all the time with subjective cognitive impairment who get much better. That can actually go on for a decade. And that's why we have a, a, quite a big window to treat this. But you want to get in as early as possible. Now, after a decade or so, you now become what's called MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And by definition, that means not only are you aware that there's something wrong, and though again, as we talked about earlier, you, you may deny it at this point, but in fact, the tests are now showing that you're not doing so well. And that is most of those people will get better, but not everybody. And so again, we want to get people, you know, the earlier, the better. Now, MCI converts to full-blown Alzheimer's. And by definition, when you have Alzheimer's, that means you've begun to lose the activities of daily living, the taking care of yourself, the dressing yourself, the showering, that's true dementia. So you can see that's a very late condition. We, you know, we should be impacting this much earlier. Uh, we should be treating this much, much earlier. Some of those people get better. And we have had people, and I described it in the book, we've had people with MOCA scores of zero who actually improved. People who went from not dressing themselves to dressing themselves, from not speaking much at all to speaking, even interacting on uh, emails and internet and things like that. But for those mm -hmm. who were in very, very late stages, they did not come back to normal. They improved, but they didn't come back to normal. Mm. Whereas the ones that were earlier on, they can come back to doing very, in fact, not only to normal, they actually say, gee, I, I'm doing better than I've done for years. Because again, you think about what we call normal cognition is not always our optimal cognition. We're just used to it. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah. One of the, the, the take-home lessons here is that we can do better. And I have a chapter in the new book that's coming out on how to enhance normal cognition. And so these are you know, critical things to do. And we've seen these amazing stories, uh, and I describe some of them in the book, people who are you know, doing better with uh, going back to work, uh, a person who went, for example, from ninth percentile on their cognitive testing to the 97th percentile, just oh, wow. improvements. Um, people who getting back, we have one woman, for example, who got back the ability to read piano notes. She had played the piano for years. She lost that uh, with uh, early Alzheimer's and she got it back um, and is playing the piano and doing very well still. The most important point of all this is that when, you've, when you go on a drug, you may get a little bump, but you go right back to declining again. The approach we've taken, since it actually targets what's causing the decline, the people who get better sustain their improvement. And we've now had people on for over seven years who have sustained their improvement. These are people that would likely be in nursing homes by now and who have sustained their improvement. And by the way, a few of them have gone off and back on. When you go off, you start doing all the wrong things, then in fact, within typically about seven to 10 days, you start noticing a decline again. And when you go back on, you improve once again. Yeah, that's so awesome. I remember some of these stories from your presentation at the Metabolic Health Summit. It's so cool. And all these things you're talking about are basically lifestyle and diet modification. And it's so amazing that this is possible with that. I mean, I guess we've already kind of touched on that, but also in your book, End of Alzheimer's, you mentioned that Alzheimer's is one of the only, oh, it is the only disease out of the top 10 killers that we have no treatment for. That's, that's right, that there's been nothing for it. And I should say, you know, a lot of people say, oh, this is about diet and lifestyle. Well, yes, but most importantly, it's about targeting what's actually causing it. For many people, Diet and lifestyle have a big impact. And of course, I never learned this in medical school that in fact, diet yeah. has such a huge impact on my life. 
But for other people, you can't stop there. So what you really need to do is start with the initial stuff, see how it goes. And if things are still going downhill, you need to find out. You may be exposed to mycotoxins that you're not aware of. You may have specific pathogens. As an example, we had a woman who went from 35th percentile to 98th percentile, did absolutely great. Then she started having problems and started slipping. And the question was, what the heck was going on here? And it turned out she actually had an infection from a tick-borne illness that she was unaware of. So again, this goes back to what Alzheimer's is all about. When you make that amyloid, it is a part of your innate immune system, of the evolutionarily old part of your immune system. You are protecting yourself. So you need to find out why you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. And I should have said that too. You, you're all about the customized approach and you know the six different types you mentioned. So we can't just say, oh yeah, do these simple diet and lifestyle changes and you're fine. You have to look into which one you have specifically. So what's with the medical system in general? I kind of bring this up a lot, but when it comes to Alzheimer's, it seems like we're making the same mistakes that we're, we're doing everywhere else where we're not looking at the root cause. We're not, people aren't talking about this stuff. Have you seen changes? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting you say that. There are beginning to be changes that people are starting to look at doing uh, trials with more than one drug and that sort of thing. Uh, although I've been disappointed so far, there hasn't been a single trial. We have actually coming up now the first trial where we will actually look at what's causing the cognitive decline that hasn't been done before. But, you know, if you could imagine, go back to when there were only mainframe computers and we had people starting to say, hey, you should have a computer at your home, a desktop computer. Well, imagine that the guys that made the mainframe computers just said, absolutely not. A computer at your home makes absolutely no sense. It could be dangerous. You could do something wrong. The computer could hurt you. You could get a shock plugging it in. This is the sort of mm -hmm. response that we're hearing now about doing anything other than the usual single drug treatment. People are saying, oh, you know, there are going to be problems and you shouldn't be looking at these things. And it's uh, unfortunate. 21st century medicine is about root cause. It is about larger data sets. It is about looking at what's actually causing the illness and then targeting those with a personalized program. It's clearly getting better results than 20th century medicine, than old fashioned standard of care medicine that's still being practiced in so many places. So at some point, I think that the medical system will come around and start to realize that this is what needs to be done. It is a different way to practice, as you know, um, this is the reason for things like Institute for Functional Medicine and Integrative Medicine and P4 Medicine, all these things. These are different. Precision medicine, root cause medicine, this is the way of the future. And uh, you're right, the medical establishment hasn't figured out how to make that happen yet. Yeah, well, they're all about drugs. <laughs> yeah. It's coming around. And I think it's really important you mentioned data. I feel like the future is in big data and using that. Yeah. Well, you know, we have what I call a complexity gap in anything else. You know, if you go on an airplane and airplanes, of course, are can be flown by computers, no big problem. Or you go in a driverless car or any of these sorts of things, you have to match the complexity of the program that's written to the complexity of the task. However, medicine is the one place where the complexity of the task, looking at a human being, so incredibly complicated, the most complicated machine we know of. And you look at the complexity of the data set that we as doctors use, we look at your serum sodium and your serum potassium and a few other things. There is a huge gap in complexity of the data sets that we collect versus the data sets that are actually needed to determine why a given person is having problems. And so that needs to change. And certainly there needs to be more Silicon Valley in medicine and the ability to use these in a seamless way. You know, these sorts of computer-based approaches and algorithms should be a seamlessly integrated part of our medical system. And it's just not there yet. Yeah, well, you know, I brought that up on purpose because that's what I'm trying to build right now. It's one of my part of my company, Sapien. We're doing health technology and giving patients tools and health coaches. I, maybe I should talk to your daughter. We're looking for health coaches actually to work with our technology. Wow. And yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's similar to Verda. So Verda is yeah. doing great things. Most people know Verda Health. Sure. No, no. And yeah. Yeah. And so we're, I talked to Jeff Volick. I said, watch out, we're coming for you. <laughs> but uh, we're kind of doing the same kind of thing is using that technology to help patients and doctors and health coaches connect 
measure their ketones, measure their weight, measure their blood pressure, all these different things. And then also use that big data. I'm partnered with a great developer and who's really good at using this big data to start to crunch these numbers. And in the future, we, I think that is huge where if we get a whole bunch of inputs, I mean, maybe we you know team up with Verda or even Heads Up Health. It's a great company I, I'm friends with, founder. And we can get all this data together and then use it to an advantage. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, welcome to uh, talk to our daughter um, who is a brain health coach and she has a site, SIA Brain Health, S-I-A, S like Sam, I-A, brainhealth.com and uh, take a look at what she's doing. Absolutely. I'll try to connect with her. And yeah, people should check out the site. And I have a few more questions here. I know you, sauna, sauna is part of the, the protocol. Absolutely. So yeah, as you know, there are a number of ways to get rid of toxins. And it, I have to say again, as someone who trained in medicine in the 1970s and 80s, it's been shocking for me to see the toxins we're exposed to that we never learned about in medical school. Mm. We're just literally, we are swimming in an Alzheimer's soup every day. Mm -hmm. The air pollution, and as you know, there's a lot of evidence now that air pollution is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Smoking, another risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, toxins, as I mentioned, we talked about mycotoxins earlier. Metallotoxins like mercury, organic toxins like uh, by benzene, toluene, all these things increase risk. There are multiple ways to detox. You want to get your glutathione level up to an optimal range. Uh, you want to use a high fiber diet. That's part of the KetoFlex 12-3 diet. Absolutely hard. As you probably know, people used to have about 100 grams of fiber today. Typically, people today, about five grams of fiber today. And again, we just weren't made to live that way. We should be having much more. And whether you like to use you know, get this in your diet. That's fantastic. If you want to supplement this, you can use things like uh, organic psyllium husk, like konjac root. There are lots of ways to do this. I take this myself. I think it's a really great idea. It improves your cholesterol. It improves your blood sugar. And it detoxifies you. And then, of course, using filtered water. Absolutely good idea to do that. Uh, and then so sweating. Uh, and then, of course, urination. All of these things are good ways to detox. And they each one takes care of different things. So sweating is particularly good for things like cadmium. It turns out that there's a lot of cadmium in sweat. So if you're exposed to that, for which comes, for example, from smoking is one way to get it, um, then good thing to do. And you can sweat a number of ways. Great to do it with exercise. Great to do it with a sauna. And then if you do that, then take a, you know, get some Castile soap. It's some non-emollient soap because you don't want the emollients. They, they allow the toxins to re-enter. Get some of that, take a shower, and uh, get rid of those things so that you're literally washing them away without allowing them to re-enter. And again, all of these things are incremental. You're lowering total toxic burden. But in the long run, it's very helpful. Yeah. And, and so detox, sometimes it gets mixed up with this sort of woo woo, like hippie type of thing. But you're talking about this is, you know, real science and not just some some weird like juice, sugary juice cleanse that really may just be a load of sugar yeah, and not a real sure. detox. There's some like weird, like I've seen these like soles, you put them in on your shoes and it's they turn black or something. You know, I, the problem is there's like kind of like bogus stuff and then there's real stuff and stuff like sauna has been studied and there's heat shock proteins and there's just even just a sweating like you're talking about. Yeah. Really good point. And, you know, again, as a scientist, as someone who spent 30 years in the lab, I was so skeptical about all this stuff. You know, 15 years ago, if you told me that I was going to be talking to people about detoxing and about meditation and joy and fiber and, you know, ketogenic diets, I mean, I would have laughed at this stuff. But the reality is, you can't ignore the data. These things are important. You know, even things like leaky gut that people, some people don't even believe in. In fact, there's a mountain of data for these things. And so, yeah, detoxing is important. You can measure your glutathione level. You can measure the toxins. You can measure urinary mycotoxins, which is actually quite a good thing to do. You can measure various organic toxins. You can measure heavy metals. So these things are all measurable. They're not woo-woo. They're real and they can damage your brain. Yeah. And I also think it's really good common sense to focus on these big things that affects your body every day. Like what are the things that you take in on the highest levels? Like the food you eat, the air you breathe, the water you drink, these contact your body the most. 
And some people, they get caught up in certain like biohacking worlds and they're like trying to do these like tiny little things and they're not even focusing on just working out or just eating right. You know, we have to look at what are the big things and what are things that affect your body daily. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. The reality is that we all want that simple fix. We all, you know, if we just put this crystal on our forehead, you know, everything's going to be okay. And as you indicated, it's not that simple. Human beings are complex. That's what we see when we look at the various pathways that all that lead to Alzheimer's. There are many contributors. And absolutely, it's important what food you're eating. Absolutely, it's important if you've got insulin sensitivity, if you're achieving some ketosis, if you have a reactive oxygen damage, if you've got toxins you're exposed to. These are all critical things. Mm -hmm. and, and then sleep. I mean, I think everyone knows these days how important sleep is, but there's this old idea of, you know, just, oh, I get six hours of sleep. I'm so amazing. But I heard a doctor talking about just some anecdotal evidence. They were in a nursing home and all the people there who had Alzheimer's, he talked to their spouses and it's, and they all, the common characteristic is they all didn't get good sleep. There were these big high powered people with important jobs and they slept, you know, four to six hours a night. And I know it's just an anecdote, but we also have research showing the importance of sleep. I wish I could convince every person to get an oximeter. You can either buy one or just borrow one from your doctor for a couple of nights. Stick the oximeter, it's like a little ring essentially, you stick it on your finger and find out if your oxygen is going too low, if you are desaturating at night. I can't tell you how common this is. It contributes to cognitive decline. It contributes to macular degeneration. It contributes to other chronic illnesses. So find out if you are desaturating. You know, this is a relatively easy thing to do. It's very common. And most people aren't checking for this when you have someone with cognitive decline. So here's something that's very fixable, and yet it's not being evaluated. Mm, yeah, I haven't really heard of that one. That's interesting. So you talked about macular degeneration. So that's another one. I know you're looking into other degenerative diseases in your research. So you used the term mismatch earlier in the discussion. Mm -hmm. this, this is what we found is common for all of these degenerative conditions. There is a mismatch between the supply that's required for a given subdomain of the nervous system, whether you look at the macula, whether you look at the hippocampus, whether you look at the, at the midbrain and the, the substantia nigra, any area you look at, there are specific requirements, so specific demands and specific supplies. And each area has its own unique requirements and its own unique way to fail. So when you fail with keeping up with your trophic support and just what we were talking about with Alzheimer's, that is what Alzheimer's is all about. You've got all these contributors. You've got this amazing system that is plastic and is changing moment to moment to moment. You lose that ability. That's Alzheimer's. When you lose the ability to support complex one of the mitochondria, you get Parkinson's disease. When you look at macular degeneration, that is a different set of things. The macula is actually the area of greatest metabolic activity. So all the things that are supporting that, as those begin to fail, as you have a chronic or repeated mismatch there, and of course, each of these is playing on your own unique genome. So no surprise, certain genomes are more likely to fail on the Alzheimer's side. Other genomes are more likely to fail on the Parkinson's side or the macula or degeneration side, or the Lewy body side, or the ALS side, and so forth and so on. So we've started a project that we call the ARC project. So just these Noah's ARC was, you know, two by two by two. We're having mm -hmm. just a few people who are early in the course who are interested in looking at all the things contributing to their degenerative process to look to see whether we can now, again, do just as with cognitive decline, whether we can tip the scales back in favor of the support instead of the demand. For all of these illnesses, you get these when the demand exceeds the support. That's so awesome. Yeah, I actually have been talking to an eye doctor who has done a ton of research into macular degeneration and is really believes it's all about these diet and lifestyle things. And it's really going against the rest of his peers 
who just don't really accept it, right? It, he's writing a book on it. He's doing presentations about it. So that's really cool. So yes, yeah, so you have a new book coming out. Does that have a title yet? Yeah, The First Survivors of Alzheimer's Disease. And so this, it's, we have, you know, when, when I published the last one, people wrote and said, well, number one, we'd like more details on, you know, what, what are the websites? What are the specifics? And the first one was really about how we can do this for the first time. It was about the background science and about the various blood tests to get and things like that. But people wanted more detail. And they also wanted to hear from people who had gotten better. And so we have some wonderful first person stories from people who had been told there was no hope, who then got better. And they wrote about these amazing stories about what it felt like to have Alzheimer's or early Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's and then to get better. And then what it took to keep themselves better. And so uh, very excited about the, these wonderful stories. That's great. What's going to happen in the future? You kind of look into this aging and uh, what is it called? Like life extension. It, it seems kind of up your alley of Alzheimer's and the brain. What's going to happen in the future? If Are we going to figure out Alzheimer's and then what are people going to die of? Well, that's a good point. I think that, you know, again, the, in 20th century, we were all dying of these uh, simple acute illnesses. And this is now the next stage in the 21st century. Uh, most of us are dying of these complex chronic illnesses. And I think that these are going to be treated effectively. I think that the, you know, with the 21st century, we'll see the end or the virtual end to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, to uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and to these other complex chronic illnesses like cardiovascular disease. These will be things that we can make rare diseases. And then you're right. Then we have to think about once we are past those, what is actually going to lead to the aging and ultimately death? And you can separate these essentially into the things that are going on underneath this, things like telomere shortening over time, um, things like damage to mitochondria that that can't be repaired. So long-term DNA damage, for example, that isn't repaired. Things like that will then become more important. And then I think that will be the next step. People will address that. And I do think that there is a tremendous potential in stem cells. Of course, there's a lot of charlatanism these days, and there are a lot of people interested in stem cells. Um, But I think this is coming as a very, very important part of the clinical armamentarium for the future. And I think in that sense, there will be a lot of renewal. And I think it will be pretty common for people to avoid these complex chronic illness um, and live. Now, whether they will live to, you know, 100, 120, 20, 200, I don't know yet. It, it depends on our determining these things. To some extent, of course, when various organisms, including humans, are born, they are imbued with a, a certain lifespan. You know, it's hard to make a mouse live for 100 years, but you can get a mouse mm-hmm. to live for a lot of extra time, not 100 years so far. So I think, you know, to some extent, we were born with a capacity, um, and it's going to take a lot to alter that capacity too much. But what we're doing now Mm -hmm. is the other way around. We are damaging it. As you know, in fact, this is the first century where it's been predicted that the lifespan will actually go backwards because of the obesity epidemic, because of the diabetes epidemic, because of all the processed food and toxins and damage that we are exposed to. So we're going to, we need to get rid of all that and then start focusing on things like, okay, what do we do about stem cells? What do we do about telomeres? What do we do about the underlying mechanisms that are leading to degeneration and leading ultimately to aging and senescence and death? Mm, Yeah. So yeah, I guess to wrap it up and just let people know if they want to live the longest, healthiest life possible, what are the top things to do just give me one last wrap up on how they can just live optimally. Well, I think the to me, the thing to do would be to combine knowledge about where you stand. It's always better not to do it blind. Get some basics. Check out to see where you stand with respect to your insulin resistance and with respect to your ongoing systemic inflammation, with respect to your toxin exposure um, and your metabolome and your microbiome. These are all critical things to know. So that's the first thing to do. And then the second thing I think you said earlier, which is to live the way that our bodies were designed evolutionarily to live. And that is the approach that, you know, where you are in ketosis, fat 
fasting is turning out to be incredibly powerful. As you know, people are looking at this as an anti-aging and have been for years and years. And it's been you know, well-determined repeatedly. The so-called caloric restriction approach um, has led to improvements, for example, in mouse lifespan again and again. So I think improving health with respect to those parameters is the way to go. Uh, and that does have to do with living the way our ancestors showed us work the best. Yeah. Sabian lifestyle is what I'm trying to call it. <laughs> it's pretty simple. It's, it's, I'm not reinventing the wheel here, but just living like homo sapiens should. And it's, yeah, it's all the things we mentioned, sleeping well, eating well, being outside, exercising. I forgot to mention BDNF, and that's something that you can improve by exercising and it's good for your brain. All positive community connections, all these things. Well, so it's great to hear for some people who haven't heard this before that you can have some power in this, that you're not powerless to Alzheimer's, that you can have some control and they're all very straightforward. They're not impossible to do. So I'd say check out your book, End of Alzheimer's. Look forward to your new book and drbredesen.com. That's D-R-B-R-E-D-E-S-E-N.com. Anything yeah, else? Yeah, no, the, I think the point is we can reduce the global burden of dementia. And we've been told that there's nothing we can do about cognitive decline. And in fact, the answer is just the opposite. There is a tremendous armamentarium that we have to prevent and to fight cognitive decline. I love it. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone makes some changes in their life if they aren't already doing this. All right. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, everyone. I think this is going to be it for season three. I needed a little break to collect some more interviews. It should only be a couple weeks. Remember, there's a whole array of ways to support the show and the film, from $2 on Patreon to pre-ordering the film and getting your name in the credits on Indiegogo, all the way up to a giant $200 box of grass-fed meat delivered to your door. Find all the links in the show notes and find me on Instagram and YouTube and all the places. Stay happy and healthy and live that sapien lifestyle, and I'll see you soon. Bye.